Hello, fellow commuters and those of you who listen to audiobooks. Kareen Smith here. Today I'm going to talk about three authors uh, whose books I have listened to in my car. It's because of their curiosities and their extensive historical research that I learned a lot on the way to and from work. Even on topics that at first I wasn't too sure I was even interested in. Know what I mean? Anyway, these three authors have different approaches, different sets of interests from one another. Admittedly, they may not all appeal to you, and that's okay, too. As always, of course, I highly recommend that you try finding these books as read by the authors themselves in their own voices if you can. Now, for two of these authors, that's not always possible because a number of their books have been read instead by professional narrators. Anyway, let's get started, and we're going to begin with Sarah Vow. You may know her from her work in radio and in film. She's also written a variety of nonfiction books on topics of American history and culture. I listened to two of them this year. First one was Lafayette in the Somewhat United States. Now, you've probably heard of the Marquis de Lafayette. He's the aristocratic Frenchman who came over from France to help the colonials win the American Revolutionary War. That's the short version. He was only 19 years old at the time. Hmm. I don't think we learned that part in school. And then, four decades later, he came back and toured the country and went all around. He was welcomed with honors and celebrations at every turn. It was a very big deal. Why? Why was this guy so revered and so important to the origins of this country? Why are streets and cities and other places still named after him and after his estate, LaGrange? These are the kinds of questions for which Sarah wants to ferret out the answers. And so we follow along as she does her research and as she visits battle sites and other locations where important turning points in the revolution took place. Sarah relates the facts of the subject. She's sure to do so. She also uses sarcasm and snarkiness, snarkiness when it is appropriate to do so. There are multiple times when it is appropriate to do so. She puts herself into the story and invites us to join her in her ongoing research. Her young nephew often accompanies her on these historical excursions and she lets us know uh, what his reactions are to the facts and the places and all of that kind of thing. So we get another perspective, a younger perspective as well. Sarah narrates her own books. Uh, she has a deliberate way of speaking. If you have not heard her voice before, you may have to get used to it for a few minutes. I guarantee you that if you listen to this book, you will not soon forget anything about the Marquis de Lafayette and the monumental role that France played in the origins of our country. Without France's help back then, would we even all be here right now? Would we be speaking with British accents? Would we still be British subjects? I don't know. These are questions that are open to a debate. I highly recommend Lafayette in the somewhat United States. The other book that I listened to from Sarah was Unfamiliar Fishes, which is really a history of the Hawaiian Islands. Now, those of us who live in the continental United States may not give a lot of thought to Hawaii on a regular basis, just just as we probably don't think about the Marquis de Lafayette every day of the week, right? However, <clears throat> as I record this video, it's been a little more than a month since the island of Maui was devastated by a raging wildfire, sadly. So suddenly Hawaii is in the news a lot more than it usually is for those of us who live on the mainland. I had listened to Sarah's book earlier in the year, and when the story broke about the fire, I immediately recalled some of the stories that she told here, um, they were relevant to what had happened. So if you're curious about H Hawaiian history and especially how and why Hawaii became part of the United States, this is the book for you. You will learn a lot about that. Um, basically, the island's early interactions with Westerners came down to the voyages of Captain Cook and the work of missionaries from New England. 
many missionaries from New England. Uh, again, who knew? Uh, we who don't live there didn't, didn't learn this. Uh, we didn't learn these details in school. None of the things that I'm talking about here did we learn in school. <laughs> Because we didn't have time. But now we have the time, especially when we're commuting to work. So unfamiliar fishes, uh, a dive into Hawaiian history, even if you're not sure you, you're interested. Even if you just think of Hawaii as a vacation destination. Uh, cool book. Sarah has written more books in the course than these two. Um, you may choose to dive into them. Um, thank you, Sarah for your work and for your entertainment and, of course, for your snarkiness. It is well appreciated. Next author I want to talk about is Bill Bryson. Now, I waved this book around during my video about books on walking, and certainly it's one of his most popular ones. I read it in print when it first came out. This is my paperback copy. A lot of Appalachian Trail folks and a lot of avid hikers don't appreciate it. We'll just let that sit that right down there. You could listen to this book if you want to, um, but beware there are two audio versions of it out. One is an abridged version of five CDs that Bill Bryson reads himself, and the other is an unabridged and complete edition on nine CDs that's narrated by Ron McClarity. So you have to make a decision. Do you want Bill to tell you the story in person in short form? Or do you want Ron to let you in on the whole thing? Your choice. Anyway, I did not listen to that this year. I listened to full two full audiobooks from Bill Bryson this year. That was not one of them. But the first one is, whoa, it's heavy. At Home, A Short History of Private Life. I'm pretty sure that I read this book in print when it first came out in 2010. Anyway... I saw it on a library CD shelf and I thought, okay, why not? I'll go back to it and I'll listen to it this time. I didn't remember all the details of the book, but I did remember its premise. Bill goes through every room in the house and analyzes its history. Not only of that kind of room, but also of the major pieces in it and why we use it the way we do. The easiest examples here to think of are bathrooms and kitchens. When did they become uh, common to house building? When did indoor plumbing become a standard feature? Uh, what about flush toilets? What about refrigerators? I'm looking at my own refrigerator across the room here because <clears throat> I'm always sitting in my kitchen. Um, you get the picture for every room in the house and for the ways houses are constructed and architecture in general. Uh, Bill uses his own home as an example. It happens to be a former parsonage sitting in the English countryside. Uh, so a lot of his focus is on how architecture and interior design developed in Europe and in Great Britain. Um, but of course, a lot of those things apply to American construction as well, and he makes note of that whenever it's appropriate. Now, <clears throat> This is a heavy book. <laughs> Not heavy, well, heavy heavy in content, but also heavy, <laughs> heavy in weight. Now, if you've read some of Bill's other books, you may, especially the earlier ones like The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, you may be familiar with some of his personal history. He grew up in Iowa. And then it was in his early adulthood that he visited and then lived in England and here he met and married his wife Cynthia and she's English and so they live in England. I'm simplifying the story there. Bill, no Bill Bryson now has dual citizenship and since he has spent decades living in England he also speaks with a slight British accent even though he was born in Iowa. Kind of interesting uh, when you know his background, it's kind of startling to hear him talk for the first time if you know of his origins. But that's kind of the cool part of this whole process too, right? You get to hear the author themselves. The other book <clears throat> this year that Bill Bryson read to me during my commute is One Summer America 1927. My overall reaction to this book is O-M-G. <clears throat> All of this stuff happened in just one year, a year when my own grandparents 
were busy raising their children and these were the stories that were happening these are what the stories were that they were reading in their newspapers back then it it's amazing 1927 contained the summer that Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean by himself okay and then he barnstormed all over the United States by himself to um, celebrate his success. Kind of like the Marquis de Lafayette coming back and doing the whole kind of tour, too. Anyway, Babe Ruth was also on his way to hitting 60 home runs that year. Nobody had ever done that before. Italian immigrants Niccolo Sacco and Bartomel, Bartom, Bartolomeo, you know, Vanzetti were executed for having killed two administrators at a, during a, at a shoe factory during a robbery seven years earlier. And the court case took the country by storm, too. Uh, were they really guilty? There's a whole thing about that. At the same time, the Mississippi River was flooding big time, and Herbert Hoover was a key person in helping the victims of the flood. And then, 1927... Also, the time of prohibition, people were bootlegging, yada, 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 yada. Bill goes into all of these stories in depth. He supplies the background for each one, how it all culminates, cul culminates, I can't talk, and coalesces into this, just this one time period. For example, what other aviators were trying to make the ocean in one go to? Um, how did Herbert Hoover get involved in the flood re relief game? <laughs> there you go. The, the, the wow. The stories are just amazing. Again, we didn't learn this in school, at least not in this much detail. Not in this much detail. One Summer, America, 1927. Wow. Wow. Bill, of course, has written a number of other books. Some focus on Great Britain and on English topics, so if you are an Anglophile, you may want to dip into those as well. He's the kind of person who gets curious, just like Sarah Val, gets curious about something and then dives deep into it to figure it all out. You know? So thank you, Bill. And thank you again, Sarah. The third author that I want to talk about today is David McCulloch. And here, read anything. In print, listen to it, anything. Any number of his number of books. If you can get audiobooks where he reads them, which is not all the time, do so. Of course, he's a historian and someone else who becomes curious <clears throat> about an interesting person or place or event <clears throat> and then really digs into the details of it determinedly and deliciously. I have listened to at least four of his books that I can remember. Johnstown Flood was the first one. Wow. Uh... As, as somebody who lived within an hour of Johnstown for a number of years, just, wow. Uh, another one's The Wright Brothers, which I recommended in my video about favorite memoirs to listen to while commuting. Another, another wow. These were two amazing men with a, such a singular focus that they spent their whole lives pursuing that one goal. And you have to admire their tenacity, at least, not to mention their uh, contributions to aviation. Okay, The Pioneers, the heroic story of the settlers who brought the American ideal west. This one, not as obvious, it's about the earlier movement toward westward expansion when they called the Northwest Territories that part of the continent that was really Ohio and the Great Lakes region. Okay, And this book really centers on the settling and founding of the city of Marietta, Ohio, right along the Ohio River. You listen to this one and the history behind it all and you just want to go and see the place for yourself. Uh, at least that's the way it hit me. I haven't yet gone. I've traveled through Ohio quite a number of times. I haven't yet hit Marietta. I will <laughs> hit Marietta, Ohio one of these times. And the CD sets of the Pioneers and the Wright Brothers are read by David McCulloch himself. Okay. Uh, Edward Hermann reads the Johnstown Flood on the CD set and uh, is very good at, he's wonderful at conveying the emotions and the realities surrounding this tragedy. And then, this year, I listened to The Path Between the Seas 
which is about the building of the Panama Canal. This is another OMG. Sure, okay, so we know now there's a canal down in Panama that links the Atlantic with the Pacific so that ships don't have to go all the way around South America and they don't have to go through all the turbulent waters at the, at the bottom there at Cape Hope. Okay, and using the canal can obviously save time and money when ships are going through that canal. And when you look at a map, and I always have a map handy, um, and the only one I could really find that had the thing is, is this one. You know, you know. Panama, uh, it's only about 50 miles wide. It's the, sh it's the shortest distance between the two oceans. So sure, you look at that and you think, oh, it makes perfect sense. Just dig a ditch and there you go. Atlantic meet Pacific, Pacific meet Atlantic. <laughs> it is not that easy. <laughs> it, it sure, it sure isn't. Um, I, <laughs> what could be, what could be difficult about such a project? Well, let's see. There's a river that's in the way, first of all. There are some mountains in the way, next, once you figure out how to deal with the river. And then you've got a climate where yellow fever and malaria are common and they can take their own toll on human beings trying to work in the area. So yeah, in addition to all the engineering and all the geology and all of, uh, all of it, it, it involves a whole lot more planning, of course, and a lot more work than just digging a ditch. Of course it does. Okay, which is why it takes so long to do and why it takes so long <laughs> to describe and when it's done, then there are questions. Who's, who's going to run it and who's going to own it when it's part of international trade? Okay. Um, this, these are the things that you, that you learn here. The French tried for years to accomplish this task and they just couldn't make it happen. And that's about half of the book or, or even more than half of the book. Uh, and then the United States stepped in and it still took, of course, a lot more time, a lot more, a lot more of everything. And of course, early on, this is another thing I don't think we learned in school, early on, a lot of people argued to have it go through Nicaragua. We could have had a Nicaraguan canal instead of a Panama canal. Really? Okay. I don't remember hearing about that before. And you may say, yes, well, you know, this sounds all very good historically, but this sounds like it's going to be mostly about engineering and mechanics. It's going to get too technical for me. No, <clears throat> no. Yes, of course, David has to include that stuff here because it's important and it's vital and it's, it's part of the whole challenge of the, of the task. Um, but as with all of David McCulloch's books, and actually Bill Bryson's and Sarah Vow's, this is a story about people. It's about people who had a goal in mind and they thought they knew how to achieve it, but there were so many unexpected challenges along the way that it just took a lot more people, a lot more time, a lot more of everything to do. Um, so this is a story about people and it's a story about problem solving, major, major problem solving. Um, I highly recommend it. Even if you don't think, oh, Panama Canal, how, how interesting can it be? <laughs> Just listen to a little bit of it and read a little bit of it and you'll, and you'll know. It is a chunkster, okay? Admittedly, <laughs> it is a chunkster, both in print and in audio form. So it's going to take you some time. Uh, you should know there are two versions of this audiobook, similar to Walk in the Woods. Um, there are two versions, a short version and a long version. The long, unabridged version has 27 discs. The abridged, shorter version has only eight. So it is really, really, really abridged and really much shorter. And David does not narrate either one of them. Uh, and there are two different narrators and they have two different... I listened to parts of both. They have two different ways of speaking. Um, so uh, there's some challenges listening to it too. Still, the path between the seas. Oh, it's just an amazing story. Well worth listening to, well worth, well worth reading if you don't want to listen to it. Of course, sadly, David McCulloch will not be sharing any more of his stories with us. He left us in 2020 and he leaves behind 
a large catalog of books on American history. Um, <clears throat> you know, more than I have been showing you here, and of course you know a lot of the other ones, John Adams, Truman, a lot of other ones. Be sure to look them up in your local library or your local independent bookstore. So, do you want to turn your daily commute into a history lesson? Then spend some time with Sarah Val, Bill Bryson, and David McCulloch. And you will end up being smarter than the person driving in the car next to you. At least you'll be smarter about Hawaii and Panama and <laughs> and, and the settling of Marietta, Ohio, and the Johnstown Flood, and the year 1927. Um, uh, again, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, David, for all of these cool stories to listen to as we make our way to work so that we can hear all these cool things that other people have done and why we live the way we do today. Marquis de Lafayette. How can you forget? <laughs> anyway. Those are my recommendations for you today. I'm Corrine Smith. I'm sure I will see you back here soon with some more book and listening suggestions. Now go pick up some for yourself. Thanks. <laughs>